In this presentation, I'm going to look at the spatial type of the theatre. This is the reconstructed plan of an ancient Greek theatre at a place called Thorikos. It dates from around 500 BCE. The theatre has four distinct spatial components. Two are related to the prehistoric house, the other two are innovative. The first component is the porched room over on the left. It's the shrine to Dionysius. He was the pagan god of festival. The shrine looks out onto an empty space directly in front. This is the performance space. It is the second component. It is sometimes called a stage or arena. The ancient Greeks called it an orchestra. The theatre transformation turns the court of the prehistoric house into a performance space and the interior room into a shrine. The transformation can be diagrammed with this sequence of slides. Notice at the end the interior space disappears. The theatrical transformation raises the surface of the court up and off the ground to form the stage. Psychodynamically, a space singled out in this manner is intended to focus attention inward so that everyone can look at the same thing. The stage is secluded and inward looking. It serves as a place for people to gather around and to share thoughts and ideas. Theatrical space is primarily about thinking and imagining. The third and fourth components of the theatre come from practical considerations based on the need for all members of the assembled group to see and to hear what is taking place on the stage. The theatre at Thorikos had a rectangular stage, but more often the Greek stage was circular. This is a plan diagram showing the first phase of the formation of the theatre of Dionysius in Athens. Notice there are two clear components, a shrine, or porched room, and a circular stage. This is a sketch plan of the archaeological remains of the Athenian theatre of Dionysius. Over time, the original shrine and stage were added to, so they are hard to make out in this plan. The two most important additions were, first, the step seating around the stage, known as the auditorium, and second, the wall behind it, known as the scene wall. In its most primitive form, Greek theatre was the final stage of a ritual ceremony that acted out the entrance of the god Dionysius from the countryside and into the city. Dionysius's journey involved great revelry, including drinking, singing, dancing and dressing up in costume. When the god arrived at his inner city destination, the dancing and singing would continue in a circle in front of his shrine. People would gather about to watch the singing and dancing and the positions they took eventually gave rise to the fixed form of the seating around the circular stage. The wall opposite the seating was introduced so as to throw the sounds made by the performers back in the direction of the assembled spectators. This is the plan of the ancient Greek theatre at Epidavros, built around 350 BCE. As the Greeks became more self-conscious about theatre, so their theatrical buildings came to be organised in a very particular way. The theatre at Epidavros is a splendid example. There are three things to notice. First, the Dionysius shrine has disappeared. Second, the auditorium and stage are bound together by a single geometrical figure based on a circle. Third, the scene wall has transformed into a building. Here's a view of the remains. It looks from the auditorium down onto the circular figure of the stage. You can see the remains of the scene building behind. Originally, the scene building would have been much taller so the theatrical space would have been more inward-looking than it appears here. 
Here's a view looking the other way. Notice how the curvature of the auditorium makes the sky appear as an enormous dished ceiling. The dancing and singing would have filled the entire theatrical space, making the world outside seem distant and remote. The crisp geometry and precise cutting and placing of the stonework would have contributed to the affective power of the total theatrical event. It's no coincidence that the architectural developments leading to the theatre of Epidavros corresponded to the time when Plato was writing his dialogues. I'm assuming you are all familiar with the name Plato. In Book Two of the Laws, Plato explores ideas that are highly relevant to the psychodynamics of the theatre. He writes, For men say that the young of all creatures cannot be quiet in their bodies or in their voices. They are always wanting to move and cry out, some leaping and skipping and overflowing with sportiveness and delight at something, others uttering all sorts of cries. But whereas the animals have no perception of order or disorder in their movements, that is, of rhythm or harmony, as they are called to us, the gods, who, as we say, have been appointed to be our companions in the dance, have given the pleasurable sense of harmony and rhythm. And so they stir us into life and we follow them, joining hands together in dances and songs, and these they call choruses. Chorus is the name the Greeks gave to the performance acted out on the stage. Notice how Plato compares humans with other animals. On the one hand, he says humans are like other animals because they are aware of order and pattern in the world about them. But on the other hand, humans are not like other animals because humans know they are aware of order and pattern in the world about them. For Plato, the additional human dimension of knowing is the basis of thinking. The correspondence between thinking and theatre is confirmed in the ancient meaning of the word theatre, which is to view with the mind or to make a spectacle for the mind. Theatres are places for entertaining the mind. Entertainment can involve concentration or it can involve distraction. Understood as a place of concentration, we will see how, in the modern world, the theatre became very important for the history of science. But for now, I want to look at theatre as a place of distraction, and the best way to do that is to turn to ancient Rome. The Romans had three kinds of theatrical space. All of them appear in this model reconstruction of the imperial city. They were the circus, the amphitheatre, the theatre. You will already be familiar with them because they often appear in contemporary movies. You will know the circus from the chariot racing scenes in Ben-Hur, which stars Charlton Heston. The Roman circus is what we would today call a racetrack. This is the remains of the Circus Maximus in Rome. Here is a close-up view of the imperial model showing a reconstructed Circus Maximus. The second kind of Roman theatre was called an amphitheatre. Today we would call it a stadium. You can see the notorious Roman Colosseum modelled in this slide. Here is a decorative mosaic showing the kinds of distractions that were staged in the Colosseum. You may well have seen more vivid imagery in films such as Gladiator, starring Russell Crowe, among others. Here's a photograph of what remains today. By way of comparison, I can't resist putting in this contemporary amphitheatre by the architects Herzog and de Meuron. It was built in 2008 for the Beijing Olympics. The third kind of Roman theatre was known by the generic term theatre. The one modelled in this slide is called the Theatre of Marcellus. Roman theatres were slightly different to those of the Greeks. Whereas the Greeks tended to carve the auditorium into a natural hillside setting, 
the Romans would construct a complete building that rose up as a monumental edifice on the edge of the city. This is a drawing from a recent restoration of the ancient Roman theatre in Segunto in Spain. It shows the enormous size and dominance of the scene building and the way the slope of the auditorium was calculated so as to force the spectator's attention down onto the stage and up against the scene wall. Now, in the Middle Ages, theatre building came to a halt. But it started again in the modern age. The first modern theatres were built in London in the 16th century. This drawing shows the old Globe Theatre on Bankside. These London theatres were large cylindrical structures with an open central court and encircling balconies. A large porched room structure was pushed to the back of the court and partly subsumed into the balcony ring. This is a sketch made by a visitor to another London theatre called The Swan. The notes on the sketch tell us there were four theatres like this at the time, but The Swan was the largest and most distinguished, with space for 3,000 people. Today, we can get an idea of what these early London theatres were like if we visit the reconstructed Globe Theatre down on Bankside. As well as the popular theatres in London, a more refined kind of theatre appeared in Italy. They were more elegantly designed than the London theatres, but more modest in size. Very few were actually built. This is the most famous. It was designed by an architect called Andre Palladio and is called the Teatro Olimpico. It was built around 1580 in the northern Italian city of Vicenza. What was important about Palladio's theatre was the way it demonstrated a new modern idea for the stage front, where a new science called perspective was used to cleverly construct an illusionistic spatial depth. As well as perspective, another new science called anatomy also played a part in early modern theatre design. In the 16th and 17th centuries, there were several anatomical theatres built in Europe. This shows the first one, from 1594, built in Padua, not very far from Vicenza. This is the anatomical theatre in Leiden, in the Netherlands. It was built in 1596. Students would gather on the stepped tiers to watch the dissections of human or animal bodies taking place on the raised platform at the centre of the ring. It's impossible to talk about modern theatre without also talking about modern science, and for the remainder of this talk that is what I'm going to do. In the 16th through to the 18th centuries, an entirely new way of thinking about nature began to arise. It included concepts like gravity, vacuum and light, and the people who invented it were called natural scientists. This is a painting by Joseph Wright of Derby. It was painted in 1768. It is now on show in the National Gallery in London. It's called An Experiment on a Bird in the Air Pump. Notice the way the composition is structured as a theatrical space. The bodies of the people gathered around to view the experiment are analogous to the auditorium. They are focused on the bird in the bell jar, which is analogous to the stage. The subject matter of the painting is an experiment being conducted on a bird. The bird is in the bell jar and the oxygen is being removed by an air pump which is what the gentleman who appears to be wearing a dressing gown is doing. By reducing it to a vacuum, the man is denaturing the space in the bell jar. He is making it unnatural, artificial, a space of human contrivance. Now I want you to consider this extraordinary project for a cenotaph, i.e. a monumental tomb, for Sir Isaac Newton. I'm assuming you all know who he was. It was designed by a French architect called Etienne-Louis Boulet. 
The cenotaph consists of an enormous sphere cupped by an equally gargantuan supporting drum. The design was contemporary with the painting of the bird in the air pump. Both have a connection to science. However, with the architectural project, the idea of scientific inquiry is given phenomenological and symbolic expression in a massive, voluminous form. Inside and at the bottom of the sphere is a tiny stage with Newton's sarcophagus resting upon it. The rest of the space is totally empty, but there are holes in the surface of the sphere through which natural light filters, creating the illusion of stars. The visitor to the cenotaph stands on the stage next to the sarcophagus and gazes into the artificial infinity of the surrounding sphere. If we return to the image of the anatomical theatre in Padua, we can see how Boulay's cenotaph inverts the auditorium stage relationship, because now it is the spectator who stands on the stage and the theatrical staging that fills the auditorium. Here is that inverted view. In the cenotaph, it is as if the contrived cosmos of stars and planets has taken the place of the students and the sarcophagus and visitor's viewpoint has taken the place of the flayed corpse laid out on the slab. Now, I'm going to look at a kind of theatre that is not usually associated with architecture but is very much associated with science. You will all have heard of CERN, the European Organisation for Nuclear Research. Its origins coincide with the end of World War II and the start of the Space Age. As well as the possibility of sending rockets into space, another important development in the course of the 20th century involved a new way of thinking about matter. It was called quantum electrodynamics, or QED for short. Nuclear research takes place in the denatured space of QED. To create a QED environment, a device called a Hadron Collider is used. The CERN Hadron Collider is near Geneva, where it spans the border between Switzerland and France. It's about 100 metres underground. The Hadron Collider is a particle accelerator it is used by physicists to study matter in its most elementary state. In 2008, CERN built and started up a new, larger Hadron Collider called the LHC. The LHC is a 27-kilometre ring of superconducting magnets punctuated by additional accelerating structures at intervals along the circuit. Inside the circuit, two high-energy particle beams are made to travel at close to the speed of light. The beams travel in opposite directions, in separate beam pipes. It takes 4 minutes and 20 seconds to produce the particle beam in each pipe, and 20 minutes for the beams to reach their maximum energy of 4 TeV. Once energised, the beams can circulate for many hours inside the beam pipes but once they have gained enough momentum, they are made to collide. The two beams are brought into collision inside a detector. These collisions are a kind of theatrical performance with their own special audience, consisting of thousands of scientists all around the world who watch the particles dance. To make this possible, a very special kind of auditorium has been created. To build and maintain the auditorium, CERN collaborates with institutions in at least 42 different countries. The collaboration results in a distributed computing and data storage infrastructure called the Worldwide LHC Computing Grid, abbreviated WLCG, and better known today as the Internet. Just like all the other auditoria, I have shown in this presentation, the architecture of the WLCG is composed of tiers. As the CERN website explains, 
It structures the way it uses the WLCG by means of four tiers numbered 0, 1, 2 and 3, and it is these that constitute the CERN Auditorium. Each tier is made up of several computer centres and provides a specific set of services. Between them, the tiered computer centres process, store and analyse all the data from the particle performances at CERN. Please recollect the tier belongs to the auditorium, but the auditorium does not arise out of the prehistoric house. It is an additional element invented to enhance the visitor's perception of the theatrical performance. Nevertheless, the spatial principle of the auditorium has been around for a long time. We saw it in the theatre at Epidavros, in the Colosseum in Rome and in the anatomical theatre in Padua. The auditorium appears when human groups become self-conscious of their participation in theatrical viewing. The ancient Greeks arranged themselves in auditoria to watch their tragic drama. The ancient Romans arranged themselves in auditoria to watch the Christians being thrown to the lions. Renaissance princes sat in auditoria to marvel at perspectival illusions. The mass of Londoners sat in auditoria to watch Shakespeare's plays. Medical students sat in auditoria to watch the systematic dissection of corpses. But please note there is one important difference between the theatre viewing at Epidavros and that of CERN. The difference has to do with the kinds of materials involved in staging the theatrical event. At Epidavros the entire theatrical event was acted out and observed by human bodies. The support structures for staging theatre were formed out of materials directly available in the surrounding environment, such as timber and stone. With the theatrical events at CERN, there are no human bodies directly involved. The humans are in an entirely different space, and indeed time, to the particle performances. And the support structures at CERN are made out of highly contrived materials, Electromagnetic fields and particle beams don't just lie around in forests and on hillsides waiting to be mined or harvested. They have to be coaxed into existence using all kinds of ingenious devices. The trajectory of ancient, modern and contemporary theatre would seem to imply the human need and capacity for staging acts of viewing has evolved out of itself and is heading toward increasingly remote regions of space and time. While that is happening, the practice of architectural design seems to be contributing less and less to these new forms of theatrical viewing. I wonder why. Maybe it's because architectural design can only operate in those regions of space and time that are familiar to human bodies, and so is, by definition, excluded from participating in these new kinds of theatre. But I hope that is not so. I prefer to believe it is just a matter of time, and if we wait a little longer, we will start to see architectural designers participating in the staging and performance of space exploration and QED.